Yeah, it's uh, Zeph Daniel here back, uh, Z Live, and you're on 13845 megahertz on the dial. ZephDaniel.com is the podcast. And um, we also have a lot of uh, broadcasts that go on during the week and various uh, transmissions during the week as per God's will. Literally, as per God's will, and that's you know the way it uh, that's the way it has to work. That's the way it's been for me for a decade now, almost a decade anyway. It's been that long. Uh, it's amazing that that is amazing that it's been that many years, and um, I'm just wasting away again in Margaritaville. <laughs> it looks like to me, but um, I, I suppose you know the thing is you really don't want us to. Um, you know, when you listen to um, here, you know, for example, you don't want me to uh, put on the air of the holy man. So you want it straight. OK, you want it raw and you want it unedited. You want it um, real. You know, I do, too. I, I do, too. I I was just thinking about the arts and, um, you know, how it's it, I, it's really not about being a virtuoso. You know, it's about. It's about being real, and I think that's uh, what we want to see, whether it's on the stage, in the pulpit, uh, on the screen, uh, on in, in, you know, uh, orally and audio, audio wise. We want to hear something real. It's, you know, it's almost like I'd rather hear something real and watch somebody stumble and blow their lines on the stage, but have it be real and with reckless abandon and something I can relate to that hits me in my deep in my soul that I, I'm encountering something that's making me feel a connection, you know, to this whole thing, uh, rather than someone who's just a technician that does it perfectly, that says it perfectly. And here I am receive, you know, and I'm not relating and it's been, everything that's being said is, is, is perfectly fine, but somehow I'm not relating, give it to someone who can say it a different way. And then it connects, I connect with it. And, you know, so I'm always looking for something real too. And it's hard to say what that is. You know, something that's kind of, you know, almost comedic would be, you know, you've seen the recent Charlie Sheen, um, you know, phenomenon or situation. And you see it going on the media and Twitter and, and, you know, and all that and, you know, the winning thing and, you know, some sad things. But I think how people connected and why he, he, you know, was spotty, but he... He was able to sell out some shows and, you know, get out on the road and, and, and all that. But I think what people wanted there and what they were looking for was, you know, something real. In other words, a meltdown of a Hollywood celebrity to where he was just being real. The, the, the mask comes off. He's going to be raw and screwed up like everybody else in front of you. You needed that. Uh, there was something about that that was refreshing. And there's quite a few people that, that connected with that. Now the sad thing, of course, is that's passing, you know, in his particular case. But it was something real, wasn't it? You know, that's why it became newsworthy. We're dying for something real, you know, and, and we're being given, you know, synthetic stuff and we want it real. How many times have we been fooled by the guru, you know, with the, um, you know, the, the sort of, uh, you know, with the whole, all the accoutrements and the, you know, acting a certain way in front of the cameras and saying certain things in a certain sort of hypnotic, holy kind of ethereal voice and having, you know, flowers around. And there was that whole song and dance that fooled a lot of people back in the 60s to go give all their wealth and all their trust funds, or whatever they had back then when people had money and, and um, there were kids with money and this and that. They were, they were looking for some kind of relief from this Western plasticine society, this sort of you know, synthetic society. So they're running off to India to, to um, you know, to enslave themselves to these gurus. And then it turned out that they were just another face mask. They were just another hypocrite too, you know, that had this act they put on, but it was so appealing. And yet then it turned out to be the same thing. You know, they were the same flawed human being. And so when we put on airs, you know, and I've thought about it, I've thought, you know, shouldn't I put on some kind of an air, some kind of stage makeup, you know, something. And then I think, well... You know, if I did that, you know, it'd be fine. I mean, you know, uh, so I would I would trade in a, a group of listeners for another, like, lo much larger group for a while, I guess. Uh, so this begs the question, are, is there just a small group of people looking for something real? And do the rest of us, do the majority of us want to be sort of massaged into hypnosis? Would you like me to hypnotize you? Would you like me to... um make you feel really good. I mean, not 
you know, an embarrassing conversation where something like blurting out at the dinner table during uh, Christmas dinner, some horrible thing that happened, some trauma that uh, some abuse that occurred and then pointing the finger at somebody at the table and 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 then screaming about it all. And then it's all a mess and it all unravels. And um, <laughs> yes, I guess you'd rather see that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, today we have, uh, we're going to go into the prophetic here, and um, we've got our good friend uh, Kunita coming back in, and uh, he has been here before. He has had a series of visions and things that uh, didn't make a whole lot of sense to him. He's also a poet. A lot of you know him from uh, crazylamb.com and things uh, there where he shares a lot of his poetry and writings and things. He also has a a podcast on podomatic.com called Kunita's Ramble. I used to say rant, but I think it's ramble. Am I right? Okay. Now, well, let's see what he has to say. Uh, Kunita, are you there? Yes, I'm here. It's Kunita's Ramble, correct? Yes, yes, it's Kunita's Ramble. Okay. Sometimes I rant, though. <laughs> but sometimes it's Kanita's ranting. Okay, well, look. Yeah, sometimes. Here is a person, folks, who we, that, that's going to be bringing, uh, like, you know, he's not going to be a polished individual, you know, but he's going to bring you, um, you know, he's he's been on this path for, for quite a while, then he was off of it, and then he came back and started writing verse and words and putting out podcasts just recently, and then, um, and even more recently than that, you've been given a series of visions, Yes, yes. Beginning early in the year, uh, one and then separated by a month or so, then two others in fairly rapid succession. Right, and you know these, I confirm having encountered them that the kinds of things you're getting, I'm also getting myself. Uh, it's you know these are terrifying visions. Yes, it's why I wrote to you about them uh, because of the things you had said in your podcast. I understood it, that you would understand perhaps maybe more than I did. Okay, but look, the nature of these visions is that they are showing a society unraveled. In other words, uh, what I took from them is this, that there really is no going back. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I believe there is uh, massive civil unrest coming, which will result in uh, widespread death, and I think that that also will precipitate uh, widespread evacuations and abandonments of whole areas. Uh, but if that means imprisonment or simply relocation, I don't know. Well, yeah, and I, I, I agree. And then that goes back to something I had in 2000, you know, in the early 2000s, you know, the early part of the decade, which had to do with the people of America, that the judgment of God was that the people of America would be replaced. You know, and, I'm, and that was so horrible that, in other words, that there were no people of America left. And I thought, oh, that's yeah. too, that, and back then I thought that's too extreme. Yeah, yeah, that would that would be horrifying. A vision like that 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 would. Uh... I, I never took it completely seriously because I thought, oh well, this is, must be an exaggeration. I mean, you mean all people? And then I go back to the Bible and I see where people uh, get you know are thrown into captivity and uh, the enemy takes their houses over and their businesses over. Yeah. So, you know, so th there's there's that kind of thing kind of afoot, and there's a lot of biblical justification for it. But when did you begin uh, what's that? When did you begin to get these visions? Well, you know, sometimes I would get, uh, when I was writing my verse, I, I don't know you just call it visions, just more as impressions. The actual visions began uh, after the first of the year, the, the first one on the church there on January 4th. That was... Actually, the first time something like that had happened to me, uh, and it happened to me on the road, which is interesting enough. But uh, yeah, that was the first time, and then the others came uh, in late March and in early April. Right. Okay. So, would you categorize those then as as you know, warning, uh, a warning that things are going to get a lot worse? I would categorize the. Uh, the one against the church as the announcement that God has walked out. Uh, yeah, okay. When, when it gets down to the death in their hearts, uh, I think that's, that's uh, I don't know, that sounds final to me. Uh, there's always room for repentance, I suppose, but uh, this is talking as a mass organization. They've all drank the Kool-Aid, they've all taken the bargain. Uh, and at some point, 
you're beyond redemption, I think, when you do that. Yeah, it's the second death, isn't it? I mean, that's where that leads. But we've been pointing that out for a long time, and it seems to have fallen on deaf ears. I, I guess even now that you have come forth with a prophetic warning and confirming a lot of other warnings that have been given. I'm, you know, thinking about all the prophetic voices out there that have all been kind of, you know, for, for the better part of two decades now. Um, and I'm thinking back to the, some of the originals, you know, the David Wilkerson, the, the, uh, uh, uh Dimitri Dudeman and, you know, others who have had early, uh, and others, I mean, the many others that have said similar things, and you're to me, it looks like you're coming in to put the final point on it. In other words, you know, you're coming in to say, you know, OK, yes. And now it's too late. Like but what, before they were saying, you better repent. You know, this is what's going to happen to you if you don't repent. This is the direction we're going. If you don't change, you've come in and said and that what you've been given is, um, for example, for the church, the, the word of God is departed. Yes. Yes, the word of God is, is departed. The lips are sealed because they no longer preach with the grace. They can no longer see the majesty and the glory of God because their eyes are closed, and they can no longer hear the word of God because their ears are deaf. They're isolated and they're alone, and that's why they have to use theatrics. Uh, and that's why they had to drink the Kool-Aid. It was the only source of power they had left. Well, the Kool-Aid, uh, but what you're saying is, again, this... I mean, make the deal. That, that's what I'm saying. Uh, right, and they, want their, and, they, and, then they, and then they want their kids to make the deal. And then, they yes. want, and then they want their grandchildren to make the deal. Well, you know, they are basically people who turn their back on God. So the only power that works for them now is the power of the evil one. Therefore, right. they want to pass on the only good that they have. And that's, they, they, they've been so deceived that they've turned, uh, they, they flip-flop to where they, they see good as evil and, and, and evil as good. Mm-hmm. And, and they can no longer see the difference. But Satan's not paying them anymore. In other words, their coffers are running empty. Sure, sure. That's why they're getting more frantic. It's, so it doesn't work, that thing that worked all these years. No, no, it, the, it, the steam is running out. It, we're reaching. We're reaching the end, and I think we've reached a point uh, like Israel. You know, God tolerated up to a point, and then He said, "That's it." Mm-hmm. And I think I think that's the point that we have reached uh, as a church. And I think that's why, to tell you the truth, that's why the country has reached this point. The heart of a country, the heart of its morality, of any society throughout history, always was in its religious beliefs. And when its priesthood or its ministers, or however you want to define them, begin to change or not believe those beliefs that spreads like a virus, like like a leaven among the people. It's called doubt. That's the original thing that Satan used in the garden mm-hmm. was the seed of doubt. And and that spread spread throughout our society. Well there's and a it's lot too late to call it back. A lot of these people a lot of these people now, uh Kunita, they're starting to they're starting to tune in to these you know, because they're going to have to go to you and your podcast and, and our podcast and others to get this information. Yes. And, and I'm seeing, and I know you're seeing, we've discussed this last week, that the numbers are going kind of through the roof right now. And these people are not coming forward and announcing themselves and saying, oh, I'm listening to your podcast. But you see the numbers and it's like, wow. You know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, last week it was a big increase when I did did a particular uh, show on uh, the priesthood of Melchizedek. Yeah, it uh, kind of astounded me. <laughs> yeah, uh, and and so the people are hungry, but just like it says in the uh, book of Amos, I was led to Amos where, and I wonder if I can find that verse uh, just right now while we're chatting here. Amos, what Amos eight nine to twelve, something like that. Yeah, I'm, I'm just calling it up right now to, uh, to to just get it confirmed. But it says they're thirsty and hungry for the word, and they're searching all over. They're searching high and low, and yes. and they're they're going from nation to nation, you know, and 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 podcast to podcast, if you will, and and it's but it's not there to be found, you know, it's it's not there to be found, uh, and and um, it says they shall wander from sea to sea. And from north even to the east, and shall run to and fro and seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. Amos eight twelve. Yes. And shall not find it. Those are the days we're in. Uh, they're not. You know, these people. 
these people, they the only way they, they could have gotten out, the Lord led me this morning, I was getting ready for this, and I was studying, mm-hmm. was the story of Nicodemus. Here's a man who had great knowledge, uh, was apparently faithful to his beliefs and all that, yet he was totally unmasked when he met the Lord because his knowledge was all soul and mind, nothing of the spirit and heart. Yeah. And as the Lord said, flesh gives birth to flesh, spirit gives birth to spirit. Uh, they've lost that spirit. They've just, it's just vanished. It's been taken back. Uh, That's why the Lord's on knocking agreed. on the door from the outside. I agree with you and have gotten it in the same vision, same, same take, same leading uh, independently of you. And then, and, and all this confirms many other words that were said by others who've, who've over the years have said the same thing that this would happen. And now we're here saying like you and I are like the wrap up team. Okay. You know, you know, it's, it's okay. Uh, What was said, what was predicted uh, has now come to pass. And it's not a matter of, you know, let's repent so it doesn't happen. It's okay. Now that it's happened, what do we do? You know, on an individual basis, they can all make the trip, the trip that Nicodemus made to the rooftop to talk to the Lord at night. On an individual basis, I don't know when that door closes. I don't know that we're ever told. We didn't. It's not our business to know. That's between them and the Lord. Uh, short of that, Jeff, uh, what can they do? What, you know? That that's the only option left to them, and to do that would be to turn their back and give up everything. And uh, mm-hmm. most of these men, I would categorize as hirelings at the very best. That that's the best compliment I could give them. And a hireling doesn't give up his wages. Okay, so they're not going to give it up. Not unless there's some kind of profound. If if one of them happens to be a lamb that God decides to call out, there'll be a profound change in his heart, and, and that that will you know he will he will make it out. Barring that, I don't know how they do. It's just so amazing to be born in America, you know, to have grown up here in America, to have, you know, all these godly things in Easter. I remember, you know, I was always mad I couldn't watch cartoons because they'd have the Easter services on, (laughs) you know, to have grown up in America where it was mom, apple pie and God and country, you know, and to see... Now, with this, like, for example, the Bin Laden fairy tale, you know, all, and, and, and there's one after another that they've all given in. The, the, God's nowhere in anything, not the military, not the government, not anywhere in society. He's been eradicated. So he yes. said, I guess he just said, OK, well, no more of this charade. I'm gone. See, in order to be eradicated from society, he first had to be eradicated from the church. That's what A.W. Tozier was preaching about 60 years ago, yeah. and nobody listened then either. Uh, if you read back, and I know you read some of his stuff, it, it, mm-hmm. it's, it's like, it's like a, a modern-day newspaper uh, to see what he was talking about in the church. We have produced two, three, four generations of people who think they're believers but who have uh, never— Never met the Lord. Right. You know, right. There's two there's, minutes at an altar with, with a handful of tears uh, is not redemption. Yeah, I'm, I know that uh, our friend John, who's always on in the first hour, he was saying um, that he formed a ministry once. He tried, and he failed at it. His ministry was he wanted to form a, a ministry based on an outreach to pastors to introduce— yes, I remember. <laughs> to, to introduce pastors to Jesus— he said that went over like a lead balloon. I'll bet you. <laughs> I'll bet. You're yeah. not going to tell them they don't have Jesus. They're going to they'll fight you for that one. Yes, they will. That's that's their bread. That's their money stream. You know, and and they're going to stick with what they've got. They're going to ride the horse that brought them here and uh I just don't see any way around that. Uh, you know, I talk to people occasionally, you know, short talks, neighbors, things like that. I don't get deeply into the spirit because I don't want to have problems around where I live. Uh, because based on the, the very four words that come out of their mouth, uh, yeah. you know. So, like I said, I see it from the people that go to the churches. I, I hear it from some of the people I know that, that work in the churches. And then, of course, I was trained in their system. Right. Yeah, you went to uh, seminary. Yes, I did. I only went a year, so I wasn't thoroughly indoctrinated. But as I told you before, the very first course they made me take was values clarification. That always astounded me. Uh, 
But that was the intro. That's what they used to, to bring in the seeds of doubt, to, to question what you've always believed. And once they get that little opening, then they drive the wedge in, and uh, that's the way they do it. So the purpose of sem- sem- the seminary is really a cemetery. In other words... Yes. It's to indoctrinate you into the system. Whatever system that particular denomination uh, you're serving, that's that's what they're doing. And, and, and these people, they go in, and most of them have fully good intentions in all of this, and they're simply brainwashed. They're simply... Uh, turned into a, a Manchurian candidate of the spirit, so to speak. Mm-hmm. One that will go in as a time bomb to destroy churches. Right, to destroy whatever faith there is. And then if they see like a John the Baptist guy wander in, they all jump on him to either con- con- convert him or kick him out. Yeah, I've been kicked out of several churches along the years. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't doubt it. And it's not funny. I mean, it's it's... We laugh, I think, for some kind of comedic relief of a tragic situation. It hurts at the time uh, yeah. enough, but uh, like I said, you look back after the years, and it, it, it has turned out to be a good thing, not a bad thing, so you can laugh. Well, I laugh because it's happened to me as well, and looking back on it, it was uh, hilarious that I would even go there in the first place, but I went there thinking, you know, naively, that uh, it was a shelter, you know, from the storm. Well, that's what we're raised to believe. That's why when I found, when, when the Lord found me, I don't want to say I found God. I didn't find anybody. Yeah. He found me. And uh, one of the first things I did when I, when I got out, out of jail after, after he, had, he had saved me was that uh, I looked for a church. I thought that's what you were supposed to do. It wasn't for, yeah. well, it took me another seven, eight years before uh, he jerked me out of the church system and, and began to reveal to me uh the corruption and, and the problems and, and the denominational idea that, that everybody is a separate. They're not preaching the Lord, they're preaching themselves. And the whole idea of a, of a corporation. You know, a corporation is a legal life form, formed by the state. And it can be killed by the state. It's controlled by the state. Yeah. If you incorporate, you're giving a, given a number, just like a social security system. You are an artificial, legal life form created by the state. The Lord is no longer your Lord. The state is your Lord. Right. It doesn't matter if there's only two of you. The minute you sign those papers, you've given up. You've given up uh, your redemption and your relationship. Mm-hmm. So what if you don't sign the papers and you, yeah, I mean, I, I don't have to tell you, but just for the audience that may not know, what do you think would happen if someone didn't sign the papers and they went and rented a building and put a, called it church and invited people to come uh, worship? What do you think would happen to them? If you weren't a problem, and you were very small, maybe nothing at first, but as you began to grow and if you began to evangelize and began to spread, you'd be shut down. They had one in Indianapolis here just last year that was uh, mm-hmm. shut down and confiscated by the government uh, because they didn't have the uh, the uh, right paperwork, the 501c3. Of course, they had unwisely not paid uh, property taxes and things like that. If you want to do that, I think that's the first thing you need to do. You need to pay them their money. Uh, if you don't want them to bother you, and that in itself brings other other complications. So I don't know if you want to have a, a church, you know, it almost has to be a house church. What? Well, yeah, I was just saying that if if you were a church who was five hundred one c three and you want to reform and get rid of that five hundred one c three status, what do you think they do then? Uh, well, you and I both know that all the churches are infiltrated, and most churches have a board. And all this, so a pastor would have a limited amount of authority to do something like that. Uh, at the very least, some of his people would leave with him, and, and uh, there'd be enough instigation by by the uh, people who are there to watch the government agents that that they would rent a church into, and it it might succeed. But it, it, all the other churches, everybody, the government, everybody would be watching, and they'd be after him. They'd shut them down the first opportunity they got. Okay, they being the evil state, I mean, they being... The government, yeah, the government, uh, the government agents, whatever kind of, you know, there's so many agencies anymore that control so many different things, it's hard to know who all of them are, but yeah, that's what we do. Do you think that, you know, my pet peeve lately has been, the pain I've gone through has been because of the existence of other people with a certain mindset. They don't have to do anything to me, you know, they don't have to say anything. It's just being surrounded with a certain thing, um, a certain, I, I hate to, you know, be like, to say it like this, but I would say to be surrounded with 
I'll just say it, and I, forgive me for saying it this way, because I just I, I cannot think of other word, any other way of saying it. By being surrounded by stupid people. Yeah. And, and you know, stupid meaning not born stupid, not innately stupid, but having become stupid or dumbed down, if you will. Yes. By their own will so they could get along. And then in, 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 in doing so, becoming slaves of, of the state, slaves of the system, slaves of the world, if you will. By being surrounded, I guess a better way of putting it is being surrounded by slaves who claim to be free. It, it is depressing at times. I know I, uh, I have to deal with a certain amount of public on a daily basis. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, most of my I've come to know fairly well. But, yeah, I run into that same thing. I simply pray up the protection of the Lord and, and pray off the depression when I get home if I feel any. Uh, because it does happen. That's part of the reason why I isolated myself, because I had so much trouble being with people. You know, when you love the Lord, you can't help speaking about what's on your heart, and uh, you quickly find out that most people don't really want to hear it. They're, they don't really want to see you around much. So that, that's probably part of the reason why I uh, devoted myself to my kids and the family and just kind of left the rest of the world alone for so many years. Yeah. I, I mean, I can understand that, because... In a sense, you know, you were kept kind of on ice because the Lord was going to use you at a later time. And I see, to me, you know, prophetically, what you as I say a marker, or you're like the one that comes in to say, okay, okay um, the show's over. <laughs> that's like I never, your, that's never your, thought of myself like that, but I, I can see your point. The, the curtain comes down, and the people are still sitting there dumbfounded in the audience. Your job is you come out after the curtain's down from behind the curtain, and you go, what are you waiting for? Go home. It's over. <laughs> what are you still sitting out there for? You know, what are you waiting? You know, you don't get it. It, it, it was a tragedy. It went badly. That's the end of the story. Goodbye. <laughs> yep, the curtain's come down. Yeah, curtains, yeah, but... it's down. It's like they're sitting there in the audience, and the curtain's down, and um, the, 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 the conclusion, the finale has, has, has been played out, and they won't go home. They're still sitting there like there must be some mistake. You know, I think that's a, that was also a part of that vision that I saw, not only the preachers, I saw the, the crowds. And, and they, too, were waving, cheering, doing all of these things, Yet they didn't make a sound, and I think the same reasons apply to them. Mm-hmm. And they'll sit there, and they'll sit there, and they'll sit there, and they'll watch the doom fall around them uh, because they'll be dumbfounded. Uh, almost like the Jews in World War II that, that you spoke about earlier. Yeah. They they would sit. You know, they, they just couldn't. It will not... be the churches that line them up to be shipped away, probably. Right. Yeah, they, they sit there, and they go, it couldn't be that bad. They're not going to come get us. They're, it, it's bad now, but it'll turn around, right? Yeah, and, this is America, you know. Yeah. This, this yeah, is that's Germany. Exactly what they're going to say. This is America. They're not going to haul me off somewhere. Yeah, that, that's exactly what they're going to say. Those words are going to come out of everybody's mouth, uh, or 90% of them. The other 10% are going to be the ones with guns. Okay. So you, you're, okay, now let me get to some uh, pr- sort of brass tacks here. How is there any time period that you're seeing on this uh, on the series of visions that you've had that that kind of culminate in the end of all things? I mean, are you seeing any timetable on, on no. the? Uh, no, 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 no. I didn't see anything like that uh, on the visions of destruction. And that the only word I heard was it will begin within. Uh, wow. I would look for the beginnings of some kind of civil unrest. I mean, a, a food shortage, a, uh, mm-hmm. a natural disaster, whether they're natural or contrived, uh, something along those lines that disrupts the lives of people. Mm-hmm. And I think it will be the inner cities that erupt first, and the inner cities, will it, that eruption will spread. And the people in the inner city are a more hardened personality, let's say, mm-hmm. uh, may be better armed. I think you will see polite American society overwhelmed by barbarism. That's what I think you're going to see. Barbarism, yeah, the return of barbarism and uh, yes, things. And like... it will be our barbarism. You know, they will speak our language, mm-hmm. understand our culture, and still kill our people. Yeah, they'll kill for a loaf of bread, or they'll kill for you know that kind of thing. Um, Anything. 
Yeah, and, and because they're street smart and they're street tough, and the people in the suburbs are not. And then no. br- Brother and Thomas. They will, be, they will be like lambs in front of wolves at that point. Uh, right. That may not be a correct metaphor, but you, you understand what yeah, I'm no, trying to say. Yeah, no, I mean, literal, literally lambs in front of wolves. You know, in other words, yeah. the, the wolves are, or, or humans in front of wolves. <laughs> yes. Yeah. They, yeah. they will be terrified beyond belief, uh, terrified almost into inaction. Yes. And then their, their own sets of uh, morals that they've tried to live by will prevent their, their standing up until it's too late. Right, and um, so the it's like a. I mean, we are soft. I guess that's a better way to put it. Look at suburban men, Jeff. Mm-hmm. They're soft. They're soft. They've been they've been mummified, whatever however you want to term it. Uh, you know, they'd rather the idea of a fist fight terrifies most most men like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, these men will not stand up well uh, unless they've been trained, and they won't be. I mean, I know I went from a silly kid to a, to an, in the army, and I was trained. Mm-hmm. These people on the streets—they've had a lifetime of training. Right. They're going to explode on these people in ways they never imagined. And I also, you know, would would say that the prisons will be let out. I also had that, oh, yeah. there's a vision that the that they won't be able to house people in prisons and take care of them, so they're going to let them out on the streets, and then they're going to be the honchos who are running those inner city communities. And who will a then, lot of them are still from the prisons. Yeah, and they'll they'll be able to then export that out into the suburbs where they, you know. Uh, but then there's another enemy. I mean, we, we there's enemies within enemies, plans within plans. I mean, then we have outside enemies as well. How yes. do you, how do you see outside enemies? Because that that's the inside. Uh, you know, I suppose the the real riots begin with the austerity measures that have to come to America. That'll be the beginning of the riots. And then, I could see uh, Obama inviting foreign armies in to help control out of control areas. Uh, and Obama's buddies, uh, the Chinese, the Russians, the ones that Brother Thomas are talking about, yeah. uh, maybe even go see his, his friend down in Venezuela to get some troops from, some, from uh, South America and Latin America. Mm-hmm. I, I, I could see that happening. If this man gets another term, I could see all this happening before he's out. Yeah, if he gets another term, uh, his traitorousness would – his treasonous uh, way of hating America and wanting to punish America would then – he would import that in the form of foreign troops at his mm-hmm. command into and allow them in to take out all the people that he hates, which would uh, presumably is America. I mean all America. Well, you know, and the people have been so uh, – what you said, not like dumbed down, but they would be so terrified that they would actually go along with it. Mm-hmm. They would see these troops coming in as saviors until it's too late. Yeah, kind of like the Red Dawn scenario, and, and yes. where, where, but it couldn't actually happen without the uh, compliance of the U.S. military, the Pentagon, the president, and uh, all the other people that are there in Washington would have to be a part of it. In other words, who allow it or even command it to come forward to put down the uh, out of control people who are rioting and you know before they get a foothold. So it wouldn't be like, well, yeah. Go the ahead. Top, the top brass in uh, Pentagon are all probably in agreement with this, and all forsworn on it. And as far as the average soldier, that might be a problem. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, the biggest part of our armed forces are not in this country. Right. If they're not in this country, they can't interrupt because they can't get here without the army bringing them. But you know what? There's some responsibility to them. I mean, in, in other words, we have like the Navy, the Navy SEALs, the whole thing of the ship. The Bin Laden mm-hmm. affair, and how many people had to be lying on that detail? I mean, you know, in other words, there, there had to be a lot of cover-ups and lies. So, aren't they, in a way, bringing about their own demise just by yes. by being part of this lie? Aren't they putting in danger their families back home? They're putting in danger their families and everybody around them, and and even the the people that do what they do, because the time is going to come when people have this capability. Mm-hmm. will either have to fall in line with uh, the general program or they're going to have to be eliminated. They they are a real threat. Uh, these people have capabilities that you and I simply don't have. Uh, yeah. So they either have to buy in or they're going to have to be uh, eliminated. And it all goes back to the spiritual abrogation of the Word of God and, and, and you know, bowing down to Satan, pretending to have the Lord, being covering it all up and acting like there is no such thing as the Satanism. 
and mm-hmm. and uh, and then acting like they're all just good citizens because if everyone does it, if everyone's in on it, then it disappears. It's the American gospel, you know. So that's, that's been that's, that's the real American dream. <laughs> that's right. it. That, that's and and it's about to, it's about to be fulfilled. Uh, uh, wow. And you know, it, it's a painful thing to, to to think about. You know, I mean, I grew up in this country just like you did. I have people I knew, people I loved. I drive across it every day. I get out and walk around in the land because I'm kind of that. I'm just kind of weird like that. And uh, mm-hmm. I love this land, and yet I Me too. I see this coming, and I can't stop it. Uh, I can't do anything at all other than warn and. Not very many people listening, I don't think. Well, as you said, and I, I attested this too, they're listening now. More and more of them are coming in listening because they're horrified at, at, at the possibility. Some are waking up to the idea that this all might happen. And, and my hope, and if you're listening out there, isn't it time now to drop the Satan thing? Isn't it about time to come out from that, to repent from that and, and leave it behind? Take the Lord Jesus and go forward, isn't it? Now, finally, don't you have enough proof out there? That, do you have to see everyone get killed before you finally believe when they're putting a bullet in your head? I mean, can you get it now rather than wait till you? It, how much confirmation do you need out there, folks? Do do we have to go to the next step and the next step and the next step before you finally wake up? And here's the problem, and I can hear them now. They're saying. Yeah, but how do we know that this is really all because of that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that's the greatest curse on America is that everybody thinks that their opinion or their take on something matters. Uh, and so they'll say, well, it didn't mean that to me. And they think that's, that statement matters or, or that it's important to God. You know, God's going to do what God's going to do. And whether you agree with it, like it or anything just doesn't matter. Yeah, if you want to find out what he's going to do, that's why we have the Bible. You can find out what he's done, and, you know, if you look at what he's done, we're overdue. Oh, yeah. Yeah, somebody said something, uh, some preacher years ago, and and I agree with him. He said, if uh, God doesn't punish America, he owes an apology to Sodom and Gomorrah. Wasn't that Dimitri Dudeman? Who was that, Trish? I don't remember who that was. Oh, was it Billy Graham? Was that Billy Graham? You know, I don't know. Okay. I don't agree with a lot of Billy Graham, but I would agree with that. I, but uh, you know, and and I think it's I think the time is coming due. I think uh, I think we've run out of our grace. I think you see that because we're running out of steam as a country. There's there's a uh, an entropy that seems to be just wearing us down, and it seems to be compounding itself geometrically rather than linear. Yeah, no, it's it's uh, it's exponential, definitely. And what's happening is that people are, you know, they're going into kind of what you might call a dumbfounded daze. They, it's just too much for them, so they're going to sit there and go catatonic on us. Yeah, they tune it out. They're tuning. That's why you look at the, uh, the 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 simple idiocy that's on television, and that's what it's there for, so that you can laugh and tune it out and just forget what's going on around you. Uh, and then they'll People say they've lost, they've lost their hope, Jeff. Yeah, they lost that, their hope because yes. they lost the spirit. <clears throat> right. Because what's the point of breathing? You know, I mean, there's no point in breathing if you're not going to um, serve the one that created you and live in that grace and that in that spirit. If you're not going to live, you know, if you're not going to justify the reason for your existence by you know faith, okay, by finding out why you exist mm-hmm. and then living accordingly. If you're not going to do that, then there would be no reason for you having been created in the first place, since we're not created for our own, you know, to be gods, because we know we can't be because we're going to die here. So there must be some other purpose then besides us being gods. And um, so if we're not going to serve that purpose by which we were created, for which we were created, then what's the point in having created us? Only the only thing I can think of is 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 it the the uh, the seasoning that it gives to believers and in the trials and the things that they pass through. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, you know, there there has to be a point to it. Uh, and it's it's the purification of God's people of God's church. Yeah, other people become the uh, testers of they, our faith. You know, they yeah they, the agents. 
they they test us and they they're pro, they're in a way they're just part of a, a factory type of process of you know burning off the dross if you will burning out all the impurities and so their their persecution becomes our our a gift to us to prepare us for the what's next and, and, and in reality they don't even exist it, it's all between us and god he's dealing with us yeah. by by using that uh, they're simply a tool like a screwdriver uh and, and that that's all that's all the more importance that we should give to him uh although sometimes it's difficult to do that no it, no that's true because you you ask him what why do you breathe you know and they they look at you like what do you mean and they just do what they do they're just there as kind of functionaries um, mm-hmm. doing, you know, the, being functionaries for, for their God or for whatever it is, whatever reason they have. And, um, you know, they're not all lost, you know, irrevocably, but it, it, it's, if you go long enough down that path, you do come into the second death and there's just a point of no return that where you become your own, you know, your own God. And if you're God and you're going to die, you've got a problem. Let me ask you a question. Do you, do you think a man knows when he passes that point? And think, I'm uncertain on that. I, I do. I actually think so. Uh, he may not admit it to himself, but I think there is something that happens where something has to be actually done. I mean, you know, the second death is actually an initiatory process. It's not. Mm-hmm. It's not the first time you taste of Satan's, um, you know, power. It it comes later on, but there is a point where uh, to go further, you have to, in the sight of men, you know, um, to renounce, denounce. You know, you have to, in a way, attribute the, the God is the devil and the devil is God. You have to reverse those in your heart to where you say. Almost like an Ezekiel 8 vision, uh, something like that. Yeah, like Ezekiel 8, but in, and yeah, with all the attendant atrocities, but. You, you have to actually believe that God is the devil and the devil is God. And you have to really call the Holy Spirit Satan. And then the works of the Holy Spirit, you have to say those are the works of the devil. And then the works of the devil, you have to say those are the works of the Holy Spirit. And you have to go. Now, I've met a lot of people who are reversed like that all the way. And there is those no. Those are the ones been given over to the delusion. Right. But, I mean, they don't come out. When, there's a certain point where they don't return. Yeah. And, and it, that the has where to, they're given over is what I always assumed that's what that was. Handed over, and, and yeah, it becomes blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, so it becomes like the unforgivable sin. It also becomes the second death. Um, the Bible is quite clear. There will be a lot of individuals who go the way of the second death. Yes. Uh, un, un, amazing numbers of people who, who then uh, in Matthew 7 it says there are a good number of people that you know, believe they are serving God completely. And Jesus claims that he doesn't know them. He has no relationship with them and they are workers of iniquity, you know, as another reason why they're not connected because they, uh, they've institutionalized iniquity. They've, they've somehow made it a part of their daily bread iniquity, not, you know, not iniquity that we stumble into from time to time, but some kind of system of iniquity. And and so those who have become part of that system of iniquity and call that good, Jesus rebukes them and says, "Look, I don't know who you are, and you you, you know you you're the workers of iniquity. You're you're the uh, the doers of of evil, and you've institutionalized it. It it it's it's a system thing. You know what I mean? It's it's like like being you know like being promoted to a, a general." If you get yeah, well, you know, he said in, in one of the other gospels of the same speech, it has a slightly different translation. He said, "I don't know you from where you are," and if you're standing within that system, well, yeah, like right. you're saying, exactly. that's what he's saying. If you're there, you can't be here. I can't know you. There's an impenetrable barrier. I cannot know you while you are there, and that barrier is they've given sovereignty to the state or to the mm-hmm. to themselves. Actually, is what it's, it's, yeah. it's enthroning self is what it amounts to. And a lot of them and are going to cannot reach you there. And they're going to be thinking they're going to be going on on with the Lord and on to heaven and be rewarded for all their good deeds. And they're going to yeah. get instead of that. And and nobody thinks it's them. Here's the other thing: no one thinks they're the subject of Matthew seven. I don't know anybody out there in the church system who believes that they will have that conversation with the Lord. Nobody. I agree, hundred <laughs> percent. Nobody believes that that could ever possibly happen. 
they're very proud of themselves, most of them, for all the ministry work they've done and feeding the poor. And, you know, they can list all their charity things. And, you know, they have a whole resume of things they've done that, in their mind, virtually assures uh, they're getting in good with God. They're going straight to the Lord, straight to the kingdom of heaven. They, the trying I, to buy their salvation. The idea that they would have a meeting with the Lord who would say, I don't know, that there's no connection, you know, that, that you didn't make it, that uh, it's day and night, night and day. They, that, I, that would floor them. They could not possibly even co- conceive of something like that ever not happening. Day. And then the people I know that are lambs, like, and the world laughs at them, um, most of the lamb people, they all feel like they don't measure up. I mean, you know, oh, yeah. I include yeah, myself I in this <laughs> They They all feel like they're going to get that conversation. In other words, they feel like every single day they try to do work for the Lord and they fall back and they go forward and they, they feel like they're failing and they're failures and they're no good. And, you know, there's a lot of that going on. And I can just tell you, if that's you out there, it was meant to be that way. And one day you're going to, that's going to be taken off of you and you're going to be at peace but the Lord's asking you to contend with that. You're going to have to go through that. You're not going to feel great out there. You know, those of you who are really contending for the faith and who've, you know, come out of the evil system of, of Babylon and all that, and you're walking with the Lord and you're getting persecuted and you feel like, you know, a piece of garbage and all that. It, I'm sorry. I got good news and bad news. Here's the bad news first. The bad news is that feeling that you have isn't going to go away right now. You're going to have to walk a few more steps few more miles, but one day it will be lifted and you will be in that state of total bliss and love that you, you'll be satisfied as you know, you are deep down in your soul satisfied, but you'll be overtly and in every way happy, you know, but, uh, it, it will make our joy overwhelming. Yes, but, overwhelming. I, but we are asked to walk in this struggle and it's hard when the whole world is down on you, you know? When the whole world tells you you're garbage, when the whole world, you know, feels justified in abusing you, justified in taking away whatever you have, justified in laughing at you, justified in tormenting you, justified in traumatizing you, justified in abusing you and thinking that it doesn't count with because it, it, it's off to the side there where it's a, a, a nuclear free zone where they can get away with stuff like that. But believe you me, those who are laughing now will not be laughing later. And I guarantee one day your tears will be dried and you'll stand there and he will restore you. And part of the restoration is you will witness, though I know none of you would say you need to witness it, but you will witness whether you need to or not, the Lord's justice. You will, yes. be, you will be restored and the people who tormented you and made you, some of you are traumatized from, in other words, you've been scarred so deeply you never did recover. In fact, that's well, a lot of us don't fully recover, Jeff. I'm still very awkward socially. I'm, I'm not comfortable around very many people for very long, and, and all of that. We, we, yep. we, we keep those scars as a reminder of, of the price he paid. It's a reminder, okay. you know, we are the remnant of his royal priesthood that Peter talked about, the priesthood of Melchizedek, mm-hmm. and we are to offer sacrifices daily, and what we slay is ourself every day. And that leaves scars. And in the outside world, that's their, it's their objective, to assist us in slaying ourselves every day. And they do it well. Oh, gosh, yeah. Well, tell me about Melchizedek and some of the, the research that you've done. Well, what I found fascinating was that the uh, legends, when I got back into the ancient studies, the legends that were passed on from the Jebusites echoed what the Bible had said, that they were a pastoral wandering people, and all of a sudden they were organized and founded within a generation in a city at Jerusalem. The legends say that initial that initial uh, king was Melchizedek, and he founded a kingdom and priesthood that uh, was passed on by some method of lineage. It obviously wasn't a physical lineage. And that David, when he became king of Jerusalem, didn't conquer Jerusalem. There was blood shed on a minor scale, according to the laws of the time. If blood was shed, then David had basic options. He could conquer the city and kill everyone. He could uh, sell them off into slavery. He could enslave them themselves, 
or if they offered him the crown, he could accept the crown and save face, and that's what he did. The biblical testimony that he allowed everyone to keep their property is a signature. And all the people that lived at the time would have understood that David had accepted the, king, the kingship, which also meant he accepted the priesthood of Melchizedek hmm. and passed that down. And that's the connection with Yeshua. Yes. The, the priesthood, God kept secret, the real priesthood, the priesthood of, of, of the Jews, the, priest, the priesthood of uh, Levi. It, I'm not going to say it was for show. It was there for a ritual purpose. And Satan attacked it, and 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 through his attacks, that's what brought on all the problems for the Jews. But they were there as a testimony to us, and as a cover for the true priesthood that passed down all those years to Yeshua. Mm-hmm. And now we have the power, and He cannot corrupt the priesthood of Melchizedek because the price has already been paid, and the verdict is won. And yes, yeah, a mysterious thing because it's a hidden. It's hidden. It, it is a hidden truth. I searched for for years, uh, you know, wondering about this question. And from time to time, you know, as as it comes up in your mind when you're searching, you look. And it wasn't until I was uh, studying Psalms where David used the uh, the priestly vow that uh, I have no inheritance but the Lord. Uh, that I have no inheritance in the land, only God. And I wondered why he took that vow, and that started me on the journey. And and it just opened up right right in front of my eyes. It was an amazing thing, and uh, it took me a couple of days to get over it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, okay, so the significance of, of this priesthood that's come through, isn't this the royal priesthood that uh, Peter spoke about? Exactly. It's the same thing. It's the world preaching. It's what Paul talked about. As we live, we are a living daily sacrifice. Mm-hmm. That Paul and, and Peter are talking about the same thing. That's what we do. We offer ourselves to God. And as we do that, God uses us in whatever way he needs us to bring out his word, his light, his purity, and bring life to those he chooses to bring life to. Mm-hmm. So you the- know, the, the, the believer... The believer that sacrifices himself every day, that he is that light on the hill that draws all men to the Lord. That's what that light is. He is the salt that savors the world. Without him, uh, I don't think God has any use for the world. Well, yeah, because, and, 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 you know, this is the function. I mean, he's got to work through us, right? That's why we're here. That's our purpose. To right. sacrifice to him. So instead of assessing ourselves, folks, I think, you know, maybe we just should give ourselves to the Lord and just let the chips fall where they may. You know? Well, I think that was the intention, Zeph. I mean, isn't that what you did? I mean, I know that's what I did. You just finally one day you said, God, you know, I've tried every way, upside yep. down, inside out, and I just can't make this work and nothing yeah. I do. Yes. I'm giving it to you. Yes. And that's that's what that is. And, and if it's really true, if you really mean it, uh, he will take it. Um, I really meant it that, uh, never forget that night that happened to me. And, um, I was, I was there and he answered and, um, you know, I haven't looked back. I, I, the only complaint I have is that I wish I was, you know, like you, you know, yeah. in, in, in our conversations, I wish I could do more. Oh, I wish he chose a better, you know, are you sure yeah. you want me? You know what? Why? I'm a mess. <laughs> yeah. I, I have, yeah. Yeah. Every day I, I, have, I have to come home and pray about something, you know, all this. Yeah, it, it is troubling when you look at that. And, and I'm, not, uh, I'm not particularly fluent. I'm not, uh, I'm not a good speaker. I've never stood up on a podium or anything. I think I preached one or two sermons in my whole life. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then again, you know, uh, I'd never written poetry either. And I think he let me alone a little bit at a time because it was clear that I couldn't talk when I first decided to come back, and and, and he reactivated me Mm -hmm. through your word. But I could write a little bit, and eventually the writing became something I could talk about. And then he began to open me up to to where I needed to understand that my life was also a teaching tool, and that helped to begin to talk about that. And uh, the problems I've seen are common to all lands. And and that's that's where the podcast goes most nights is is just trying to shed forth the love of God to let everyone know that He is there, He is real, He is the source of all things. Yeah, and, and, and simple and, stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, simple things like that, and it's just it becomes not so simple when the distractions of the world are there. But perhaps this 
giant judgment. And I have several pages here that that you've written, and um, and you know, I, I think this is um, you know, if there's going to be another Bible, this should go in there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. Well, there won't be, but I mean, if we were going to have another Bible, I, I, I'd say there's quite a few things, and you and Brother Thomas and a few others, we could uh, have another Bible, you know, like a like a, that, that uh, sort of like a, a kind of a wrap up Bible, you know, sort of of the, you know, I can think of quite a few uh, different um, voices out there that would would uh, qualify. And so that encourages me, you know, the fact that we're not alone. And, and we're, gosh, we're coming right up on the hour. Um, yeah, I see that. I want to you give know, the you the... spirit of God never leaves, Jeff. I mean, he never is without a remnant, ever, at yeah. any time. And all we yeah. have to do is stand up. Yeah. That, that's, that's what we do. Okay, I'll give you the... the, the go ahead and... Uh, this is it. Uh, last 30 seconds. I'm going to put you on the spot. Uh-oh. Well, I, I hadn't prepared for this. All I would say is... Uh, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, with all your strength. Give your life to the risen Savior. And believe me, the light will shine for you. Life will renew itself. I've been there. I've lived it. I've seen the dark side. Uh, I lived the dark side. I lived the lonely side. And when I found the Lord, I lived the fulfilled side. And that's the side I've been on for many, many years. And I can tell you, life is good with the Lord. Life is very good with the Lord. Is that 30 seconds? <laughs> oh, that's it. We're out of time. Kunita, Kunita's Ramble. Get over there and get fed. Those of you who are on the fence, get over there and get led. And, um, you know, get going. Don't uh, don't fool around with this thing. We're, we're all out of time. It just it goes so fast. Thank you so much uh, for being here. Thanks, Jeff. And I, we'll, 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 we'll talk soon. Stay right there. I'll talk to you after we uh, wrap this up. And, uh, folks, I got to go to music. It's Zeph Daniel, uh, ZephDaniel.com. Kanita's Ramble is Kanita's Ramble.blogs.podomatic.com, correct? Is that it? Yes. Okay. All yes, right. that's it. Okay. And, folks, uh, it wraps up another Sabbat. We will uh, see you next week. And I uh, love you, praying for you, and uh, hang in there. It's going to be all right. Don't worry.